smart Christians. I want to cover something that kind of gets overlooked a little bit regarding the Holy Spirit. We cover a lot of different aspects regarding the Holy Spirit, mainly the spiritual gifts, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, things like that. But I want to cover the, the, the root, the basics, the, the foundation of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go too far in depth because it's oftentimes when you when you give a lot, sometimes things get lost when you just give a little bit too much information. So I wanted to talk about his role and kind of our use or misuse of the Holy Spirit. For every believer, the identifying mark for every believer, whether they are new in Christ, whether they've been believers for 20, 30, 40 years, we all have the exact same identifying mark. That is the Holy Spirit. And so make no mistake about it. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are not a believer. All Christians have the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, Paul says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one spirit. So all have been baptized into the spirit. When Paul writes this and he says all, he means all. He means the person that has been a believer for some time. He means the believer that just became a believer right as he was writing this at that very moment. Those that have been believers for only a day, all have been baptized into the body, into one spirit. So there is no getting around this issue. There is no such thing as a, as a Christian who has not been, one, baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. Jesus is the one who baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. He's the one that dips us. And so when we say the identifying mark of the Holy Spirit, we mean this. When you put something, when you dip something or baptize or immerse something in uh, a particular element such as a dye whatever you dip it or baptize it in when you bring it up it's going to come up with the qualities of what you baptize it in i use the example all the time if you dip white a white cloth into some red dye or some black dye or blue dye what have you when that cloth comes up it's going to come up with the characteristics of what it was dipped into same thing with us and so when we are baptized by jesus when we are put into uh dipped into the holy spirit we have the elements or the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Obviously not to the same degree as others. We all don't have it to the same degree. Some seem to exhibit his qualities more than others, but we do have the Holy Spirit living in us, working in us. And so from time to time, you're gonna see, hopefully more often than not, you're gonna see those qualities come out. So the issue is, what is it that the Holy Spirit does? What is it he wants to do? What's his ministry? What's his role? Well, the answer is simple. He wants to testify or magnify Jesus. Look at, we're gonna look at two passages in John, John 15 and John 16. John 15, 26 says that when he comes, speaking to the, to the disciples, when this helper, the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to testify of Jesus. He says, he will testify of me. And then in verse 14 of chapter 16, he kind of reiterates the same thing. He says that he will glorify who? He will glorify himself. He will glorify the Spirit? No, He will glorify me. Well, why is that? Because the goal of the Spirit, the goal of Jesus, the goal of the Father, the goal of this whole book is to bring about salvation. That's the whole goal. That's the plan. Salvation, salvation, salvation. And so keeping that in mind, Jesus makes a statement. He says, greater works you'll do than I do because I go to the Father. Well, does He mean greater in terms of better? Well, obviously not. We are not going to do better things than what Jesus did. For one, bringing about salvation, dying for sin, that's the best thing that anybody can do, and we're not going to beat that. We're not going to beat him in terms of all the wonders and signs and things that, he, that he's shown. We're not going to beat that, though some people think they do, but we're not going to beat that. No, instead of meaning greater to be taken as it'll be, it'll be better, Greater is taken in the sense of volume. Because he goes to the Father, well, what happens? Now the Holy Spirit comes, and so instead of Jesus, who was relegated 
in the flesh, in his, in his earthly ministry, he was relegated by time and space. He could only be in one place at one time. And so wherever he was, that was it. But now, since the Holy Spirit has come and he is in us, now you've got ambassadors of this same message, not just in one place as Jesus was or, where, or even with his disciples. Now it's in many places. It's all over Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. As Jesus said, when they receive the Holy Spirit, they're going to do what? Testify of him, be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the rest of the world. So there is this natural harmony with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not coming to do something different, to set his own agenda, to strike out on something new. No, he's not going to bring about a new thing. He is going to complete the task that had already been laid out from eternity past. And so as God, as, and so as we see in the Old Testament, salvation is kind of working its way through. We see Jesus ushering in this new era of grace and the Holy Spirit being the, me the mechanism by which it's done. I mean, could you imagine Jesus having one ministry and the Holy Spirit having a totally different ministry and maybe the two are kind of competing? So when Jesus is praying that we be one as he and the Father is one, uh, that would kind of stand in stark contrast if we've got the Holy Spirit on a different page and different agenda than what Jesus was on. And so there is this natural unity that is there. As a matter of fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians is writing the church and his whole point in writing the church is concerning unity, that there be no divisions. He starts the, the book off that way. He covers divisions as it relates to marriage and parenting and so forth. And then in chapter 12, he deals with these issues of divisions and so forth as it relates to spiritual things. He starts it off by saying, chapter 12, verse 1, now concerning pneumatikon, which is, it doesn't, your verse may say spiritual gifts, but it actually means spiritual things, things of the Spirit. So now concerning these things of the Spirit, these spiritual things, what does he have to say about that? That he didn't want us to be ignorant. But notice what he says in verse 7 of chapter 12. He tells us that the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the benefit of the common good, for the benefit of everyone. It's not given so that you can have more of the Spirit for yourself to be utilized for yourself, of, for, and by you. I mean, how, how would that work? God has gifted you spiritually in certain areas so that you would use it to grow and edify you. No, it is to edify others, the common good. And I don't want to go into other aspects of the of, of spiritual gifts because people have misunderstood this and because they've misunderstood and misused this, they've applied it inappropriately. Obviously we're in first Corinthians, so they, they misapply this when it comes to, to speaking in tongues and so forth, why they think that it is to edify yourself. And Paul is not saying that Paul is contrasting how they are misusing this spiritual thing and they're, they're doing it in the inappropriate way. They are, they are misusing it to apply it to, edifying themselves when Paul says don't do that. But the purpose of the spiritual gifts is to bring about this karpos. What is karpos? It's the Greek word for fruit or result. What happens as a result of the spirit being used? What happens as a result of the spirit being manifested? It's not so that it can be manifested more in you so that you can get more. No. Uh, is to be manifested in you so the body can get more. Are you with me? The manifestation of the move of the Spirit always works with the same result in mind. That is Christ being magnified and the kingdom growing. Now, it'll grow in one of two ways. Obviously, numerically in terms of body, but also spiritually. So it'll grow this way and it'll grow that way. That's always the result. Every time you see a great manifestation, a great move of the Spirit, what do you see? When you see in the New Testament the greatest manifestation of the Spirit, you see what? You see people being added to the church. You see growth. So without going too far, I just want to just focus on this to focus on what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to testify of Jesus. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to benefit everyone else through this testifying, this magnification of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not here to promote himself, the Holy Spirit. He is here to promote Jesus, as Jesus said. And so if you see anyone promoting what looks like a promotion of the Holy Spirit, 
what looks like or what they claim is a manifestation or a move of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is not being testified to, witnessing is not taking place, then that's a sure sign that that person is lying, misled, deceiving, whatever adjectives that you want to ascribe to that person. But it's not a genuine move of the Spirit because, as I said again, a genuine move of the Spirit will require Jesus being testified of, magnified, and a growth by the body.